Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm delighted actually to welcome them all to the National Gallery. It's great to have a library conference on here today. And um, I hope you're enjoying it. And um, I just want to thank the uh, Academic and Special Libraries for asking me to speak today. Um, I'm thrilled to have an opportunity to tell you uh, uh, about the library archive operation here in the gallery. Um, and uh, I'm going to get straight into it because I know the timing is an issue. I'm conscious of time already. Um, so a little known fact um, is that the Library and Archive is actually the biggest collection here in the gallery. Uh, we have a comprehensive collection of research material relating to visual art, which comprises over 1,000 volumes in addition to substantial archival holdings. Um, it's a collection which is an important national resource for anyone interested in research and art and indeed many other subjects as well. Um, the collections which cover art from uh, medieval times, from really international art from the Middle Ages onwards, uh, are held in a number of repositories in the gallery. The Main Art Library, the ESB Centre for the Study of Irish Art, the Yates Archive, uh, the Institution Archive and Sir Dennis Mahan Library and Archive. And consisting of um, all the usual kind of stuff that you expect to find in a library from art, the monographs to uh, exhibition catalogs, pamphlets, ephemera, journals, um, and that's just kind of a, a collage of the, uh, examples of the type of material that we have. Um, and we have very important rare and antiquarian um, publications collection as well. In addition to our archive collection, which uh, really covers everything from letters to scrapbooks, photographs, there's tapestries, um, furniture, silver, objects, artworks, uh, you name it basically, we have it in the archive. And these uh, collections, uh, they really play an invaluable role supporting the work of the gallery and they are regularly consulted by artists, students, scholars, academics, museum professionals, art dealers, collectors and members of the public. So today obviously we're, we're looking at failures and all types of failed endeavours and how we learn from them and move on. And even though no, no organisation wants to be associated with failure, um, I think it's fair to say that in the past, uh, the Library and the National Gallery has suffered a catalogue of um, challenges, um, disastrous setbacks, and really, from a librarian's perspective, heartbreaking um, situations uh, over its 160 years of history. So much so that I think it's actually a remarkable achievement that we even have the library and archive collection that we have today and indeed the research service. So you have been warned, there is content in this that might be upsetting to, to <laughs> library people, okay? Um, and today I'm, I just want to shed a bit of light on that history um, and look at the uh, I suppose in particular the, to focus on the efforts over the decades in, to, to find a suitable location and home within the gallery for this collection. Surprisingly, for over a century, the gallery did not provide a dedicated um, publicly accessible space or adequate storage for the library and archive collections. Um, a sad fact that regrettably, regrettably had, con had consequences for the collection and for those trying to access it. And even today, space uh, and access remains an issue for us. But thankfully, there have been uh, some improvements. And, uh, and later on in the talk, I hope to elaborate on how the library story has changed over the last 25 years and to highlight some of the developments, and particularly in relation to public engagement, um, that have, have supported uh, the change that we, we've experienced in, in more recent years. So let's go back to the beginning. In 1854, um, the Act. Uh, here uh, provided for the establishment of a national gallery of painting, sculpture and fine art for the care of public library and the erection of a public museum in Dublin and this was passed into law. The campaign for a national gallery also addressed the need for a public library um, and at the time uh, Marsh's library was already in existence for 150 years but it was in a dilapidated state um, up in the liberties and that uh, it was decided that marshes would be incorporated into the plan for the National Gallery. Um, so uh, the librarian up in marshes as well took little persuasion uh, to get on board with this as a new house on fashionable Marion Square was part of the deal for him. So, um, 
So at first, I suppose from a librarian's perspective, things were looking very good indeed for the National Gallery of Ireland. And this is Francis Falk's designs for the, uh, um, what's the jargon wing today where the Shaw Room is. And you can see uh, that the library um, actually would, could, you know, would comp was really going to be a major part of the gallery here and would have, this is the lo lower uh, library accommodation, a library office, a library space, um, and a, a door, an entrance, separate entrance door into the facility. And even rather thoughtfully, he provided a vent for the, the foul air from the library. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the, the transfer for us, I would say, the transfer of Marsh's collections to the National Gallery never took place. Uh, Benjamin Lee Guinness funded the restoration of Marsh's library and enabled it to stay put. And with Marsh's staying put, library concerns here in the gallery slid way down the priority list. Um, so I just, I just included this picture. It's actually um, from our recent refurbishment that we, we've been through. And this is the space where the, the library uh, would have would have gone into if that had ever uh, happened, and I, I I think you can. I was looking at it, sort of going, God, could, you could really have had a beautiful library in that space, um, and that's me actually looking wistfully on at what could have been a lovely entrance uh, into a beautiful uh, 19th century library space, but. Um, uh, it was never considered again to put the library in there, and in the 1880s, the space was uh, allocated to the National Portrait Collection, which was regarded as a priority for the institution at that stage. And uh, it's still there today in some of the Irish collection as well. So that opportunity was lost, um, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, so the, the decision was really detrimental for the future development of the art library collection and, and its facilities. And it meant really from 1864, the opening of the gallery, the, the, space, the library was left with no space for consistent collection development, um, impacting on the consistency of, of uh, the material that was brought into the collection. And there was nowhere for readers to really conduct research, which resulted in a diminished awareness of the collection. Um, a legacy which unfortunately persists, persists nearly, really to this day. Um, but despite having no dedicated facilities, the holdings did expand significantly and a collection of uh, research material relating to the artworks evolved kind of organically, which is uh, kind of the nature of museum library collections. Um, and in the early years, right up until till the end of the century, the collection was just housed in the director's office. And this, I just included this because it's one of the first books actually that came into the, the library. It's a 16th, um, 16th century artist manu manual by Paolo Lomazzo. Um, and it was donated to the gallery by George Mulvaney here, who was the first director of the, the gallery. Um, he was an artist himself, and this was his manual that he used. And it's actually in quite poor condition, and you can see the, um, it's been involved in flooding and, and stuff like that over the years. So it's suffered quite a lot of damage. It's on exhibit up in, in our show upstairs at the moment if anybody wants to take a closer look. By the end of the 19th century, library fortunes seemed to be looking up. In 1897, Countess Milltown made a gift to the gallery of the contents of her home at Rusborough House. The Milltown gift, an important grand tour collection, had pictures, sculpture, engravings, silver, furniture, and in the words of the gallery director, Sir Walter Armstrong, an excellent reference library of books, which the gallery is in need of. So work began on the new wing, uh, the Milltown wing, um, in 1900, and the library was to be located at the end of the suite of galleries. These were to be dedicated to the Milltown collection, and the library was down here. Not as big a space as had, it had originally got, uh, but at least it was a dedicated space. Um, uh, the bookcases from Rusborough House were to accompany the library collection to the gallery. Um, and of course, as with any uh, library shelving issues, they caused a particular challenge. And eventually the Countess accepted, somewhat grudgingly, that the bookcases should be fitted to the room rather than the room to the bookcases. When the fit-out was completed, the Milltown Library opened its doors to the public in 1906. But contrary to media reports, which welcomed the opening of an art library for Dublin, which would be accessible to the public, in reality, it appears the library remained closed for most of the time with no dedicated staff hired for the facility. In 1918, Captain Turton, who inherited Rusborough House after the death of the Countess in 1914, 
looking to furnish his new home, wrote to the gallery requesting on long loan the Milltown Library and, uh, rather cheekily, the bookcases. <laughs> Incredibly, the governors and guardians of the National Gallery of Ireland agreed to an open-ended loan um, of this now public collection to a private individual to the adornment of their house, provided that the damage done to the walls was fixed and the bookcases replaced. The walls were repaired, but the bookcases were never replaced, and the Milltown Library closed, marking another major setback for the library. And sadly, uh, owing to space restrictions, the Milltown Library was never actually to return to the gallery. By this time, um, the library collection was quite a substantial size, the art library collection was quite a substantial size, and the, the journal uh, collection, and the, that's an image there in the middle from our journal collection, early journal collections dates back to the mid-19th century, and we also have, would have a very important auction catalogue um, collection predating actually the existence of the gallery. The collection was considered large enough for Miss Fitzgerald to, uh, uh, to, to be consulted about cataloguing the collection. And this is actually a letter um, that she's wrote to Captain Langton Douglas, who was the director at the time, discussing what she'll charge, and she's going to consult with her colleague in the National Library to see what, what, what the cost will be, and she'll keep the promises, she'll keep the cost down, because Langton Douglas, Douglas is actually going to pay, uh, I think going beyond the call of duty, is actually going to pay for the cataloguing out of his own pocket. Um, so this, this uh, so you can see the library was still not really a priority for the institution at this stage. Um, we're going into kind of the revolutionary period and independence followed by economic depression, which of course brought an extended period of neglect to all of the cultural institutions. And the difficulties in the galleries are outlined in annual reports. Lack of staff, low salaries, inadequate storage, limited space for collections, and in relation to funding, the gallery was receiving less than it had under the British administration. And this actually continues nearly up until the 1960s. For the library, the inadequate storage conditions lead to material being removed from the collection and placed in the National Library of Ireland and the Oireachtas Library. An informal arrangement between the National Library um, and, and uh, the gallery meant that scholars could, could consult um, gallery material in the reading rooms of the National Library, but there's no official uh, record of what was transferred between the two collections, and um, unfortunately it looks like a lot of that material ha has been lost to us. Um, finally, though, in 1968, uh, the Bite Wing, which is what we're in here today, opens, and this in finally included a public uh, publicly accessible uh, reading room. So you can see we're in the lecture theatre at the moment and the library is located directly across um, outside there. And um, this was a, you know, a, a major milestone obviously for the library and resulted uh, in the appointment of dedicated staff to manage the collection. But it merits surprisingly little comment in the gallery records, which is perhaps an indication of the inadequacies of the new space. There's also no uh, images that I could find. <laughs> Surprising, because this, we're moving into the 1970s, so all I could find was a floor plan, which just to give you an idea of the location of it, and this in fact is just the, the rolling shells, what the space is kind of looks like today. Um, but by the 1980s, it was clear that this space was not working. In appearance, more like a storeroom uh, than a reading room, it's basement location prone to flooding and dampness, resulting in the collection being damaged. Um, wide metal shelvings more suited to museum objects than books. And um, eventually, it was to become full to capacity. And the books were packed off. And many of them moved off site. And researchers were no longer facilitated. There was no staff for staff or public. Um, this lamentable situation was to continue for close to 10 years, and frustrations amongst the staff, academics and arts community grew, and under growing pressure from these groups, the NGI governors and guardians attempted to resolve the issues, but options explored including uh, making it a library, a staff-only facility, closing it all together, or putting it under the management of the bookshop, which was the success story of the gallery at the time. Um, Thankfully, none of these actually happened, but by the 1990s, EU funding had been secured for the Millennium Wing, and a new library was planned as part of this development. Um, unfortunately, planning objections by uh, Anthashka resulted in these plans being abandoned, and another possibility had to be found. 
The Georgian house adjacent to the gallery at the Millennium Wing, number five Clare Street, was looked at with load bearing concerns. So, really, all options were, had been exhausted at this stage. And uh, the final option was to look uh, at the basements of the two Georgian houses uh, on Marion Square, number 88 and 89, which are part of the gallery complex. And it was decided that these would be refurbished as a library reading room. And the 1968 space across the, the um, the room here across from the lecture theatre here would become a store. And this is what we have today. The art library, um, what it looked like when it first opened, more recent photograph uh, there. And um, this, it's difficult enough to get into, I have to say, but when you do get into it, when a reader can get into it, um, it, it provides access to the main library collection and the institutional archive. Um, uh, this would have, I suppose, material relating to all types and all periods of art, but originally it's kind of the main connection which was established to support the study of the, the artwork, so it's particularly strong in art of the European Western tradition. The Stacks um, is our main store area, which stores up to, I think there's about 80,000 uh, volumes in it, as well as our archive collections. So the rehabilitation of the gallery's library and uh, archive and research services is finally underway. The Millennium Wing, um, in a revised building plan, which also provided for, was also to provide for two additional research spaces and stores, the Yates Archive and the ESB Centre for the Study of Irish Art. Collections relating to Irish art um, had grown significantly in the preceding 25 years and the gallery's long-term ambition to establish um, uh, a centre uh, dedicated to art, uh, Irish art research was realised as a result of this plan. And in 19, so that's the CSIA, which is over in the, the Millennium Wing. And the Yates Archive uh, resulted from a gift in 1995 from uh, Anne Yates, the Jack the Yates, the artist's niece, um, who gifted his extensive archive um, to, to the gallery. And this uh, holds a variety of material relating to the artist and, in fact, the extended family. Um, and both of these collections uh, together document the country's rich artistic legacy and from early Celtic art to the present, and they're essential, an essential resource for anyone interested in the visual arts in Ireland and are, would regularly feature in the gallery's uh, public programmes. Um, this, this actually is just a store, well, when it originally opened it was a read, there was a reading room as well but we've, we've closed it down and just uh, the collections are accessed in the Centre for the Study of Irish Arts as storage and workspace now. Um, with, so within five years the gallery had gone from virtually having no public access, no reading rooms, inappropriate store, stores to now having uh, public access reading rooms and storage and it was a very, it's a very dispersed arrangement and uh, in fact we've lived, we're spread out amongst around the whole complex uh, which there are pros and cons to um, and it has been developed and added to over time. In 2015 the Sir Dennis Mahan reading room in number 90 Marion Square was opened um, uh, down here it's one of the, uh, the Georgian rooms um, in the, on the first floor in number 90 Marion Square and the library actually has the, the two uh, ground floor and the basement as well as work areas. Uh, Dennis, uh, so Dennis Mahan had gifted his library and archive to the gallery in 2010 and this is a really important collection uh, which covers art from classical times onward and the Italian art is, is very strongly represented, particularly the Baroque period. Uh, there's around 20,000 volumes in the collection and many of them um, particularly rare and antiquarian volumes, volumes that have been unavailable to researchers in Ireland uh, prior to this. The archive consists of a vast accumulation of correspondence and academic notes and a photographic art archive relating to um, collections and individual works of art. So, um, so um, what did I say? By no means perfect, these spaces, they've kind of given the library and archive um, a future. Um, allowing for the long-term development of the collections, uh, providing workable storage spaces and uh, research spaces. And this, um, as well as the dramatic uh, increase in staffing levels, we have a highly, highly committed team uh, today, which numbers 13, 13 of us working in the library and archives, there's a few of them there, um, and we have a team of volunteers and interns as well. Um, and really, uh, 
they have been instrumental in developing the department uh, also. Um, and all of the, uh, the, this space and these resources have led th to the repositioning of the Library and Archive Department within the gallery, putting it really in a stronger place than it's ever been in the history of the institution. And this is in contrast, I suppose, to the experience of many museum libraries um, in more recent years, which are um, being downsized and some indeed are being closed altogether. So we're kind of Oh my God, <laughs> five minutes, okay, good word. We're kind of growing while others are, are going down. It's kind of an interesting uh, contrast. So there've been many positive developments that I'm gonna fly through now, because I have to get to the end of this. Um, we've a lot of increased research activities, more researchers coming in, um, major acquisitions in terms of the internationally significant collections coming into us, advanced cataloging and processing in collections, technological developments. Uh, fellowship and internship programs, increased fundraising, and really what, what has been a key for us is uh, um, public engagement. And this is something we've worked uh, quite hard on developing over the last couple of years. And I'd mentioned about the lack of awareness about the collections in here. Um, and this, the, the, the increasing our public engagement has really been a um, significant driver of advancing um, the, the goal, I suppose, of the mission of the, the, the library, but also of changing the perception of the library and archive collections here within the institution itself. We really thought carefully about how we connect the public to um, the treasures and tell the stories that are kind of uh, documented in these hidden and behind the scenes collections. Um, We've recognised that these we're, very, we're quite niche in terms of research and researchers coming into us. So we've, we've sort of recognised that not everybody's going to come in and do a day's research, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested in the collections. They want to know about the collections and want to learn about them. Um, so we have seminars, tours, lectures, pop-up talks, open days quite regularly, and we um, make use of all the spaces, our own library spaces, but also the gallery spaces as well. And the feedback from these um, presentations are always extremely positive. Um, we we uh, sort of tie in and connect in with the, the institutional program in the gallery. Like this one here is actually relating to Caravaggio. When the Beyond Caravaggio exhibition was on, we did a whole series of open days called Caravaggio Uncovered, which was hugely popular. And you see the crowds that come in to see and to talk to us about all of these resources, and we uh, we have archives and rare books out. Um, and uh, uh, really, really positive um, day, uh, days. But, um, it, uh, the collections, of course, we, we look to connect with a broad range of audiences as well. And we've certainly um, you know, made great use of things like Library Week and Archive Week and Heritage Week. They've, they've provided us with the themes, I suppose, and opportunities to connect with a lot of different audiences and to present our collections in different ways, uh, surprising pe people about the richness and the breadth of the material held in the collections. Um, another major development for us has been our exhibition programme. And over the last probably five, five to six years, we've, we've been exhibiting material quite regularly in the gallery. I mean, books and archives are going into most displays, but um, now we have a dedicated um, uh, exhibition uh, series. The CSIA have an annual show, um, and um, in fact, this A to Z is, uh, we, we've just been given a dedicated gallery um, up between the atrium and the Millennium Wing, room 11, and the show is actually just going in as I'm standing here. It's very, it's very exciting for us, because to get a dedicated space for library and archives in an institution like the gallery, where um, display space is in high demand, is no mean feat. So this is a great... Uh, uh, milestone for us and I included that picture there because that's actually a very um, uh, it was a very basic kind of uh, display that was put together at one display case with three items in it that actually were all facsimiles they weren't even originals and uh, you can see the crowd around it as it just sort of demonstrates the public appetite and the interest there is in the in the these stories that are held uh, in the in the the library and archive material um, and of course, um, all of these have a digital uh, element to, to them. And uh, you know, we, we've had quite a strong presence on the website. We have a lot of blogs relating to our exhibitions to promote them. And um, this, I just put this up. This is our, our one of our initiatives for 2018, which is um, an Instagram, a weekly post, 52 it's called, 
and uh, our, our library and archive fellows are, are championing it at the moment, but it's been, we've only had nine posts up since the beginning of the year and already had uh, 2,000 people actively engaging with, with the posts. It's been really good. And this, uh, this actually just to show the sort of variety in the way we use the collections was for International Women's Day where we did a um, edithon, uh, Wikipedia edithon yesterday and making use of the library and archive resources, uh, updating information on, on women artists, which uh, was a great success by all accounts. So I'm going to go on um, th very quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, with all that kind of excitement going on around, around the promotion of the collections, you know, it's important that we, we don't forget our uh, raison d'etre as such, uh, to care and to manage and provide access to the collection. And uh, in doing so, that's, that's really important that we support the work of the gallery and in fact support um, artists and creativity. This is an artist, John Beatty, photographing some material in the CSIA for a piece that he later produced and that was exhibited over in the Lab Gallery. Um, and of course, we have a broader remit to encourage art scholarship generally in the country. And these are publications that, uh, NGI publications and, and more general publications that um, the library has supported the production of. Like. Uh, but in order to keep um, all, this, uh, all this going, and I've mentioned that our space is, well, it, it, uh, we're in a better position than we have been. Um, there's still a lot of challenges. And I, I mean, that's a whole other presentation, to be honest, in itself. But I, thought, I took in a few pictures because I thought pictures would uh, speak for themselves. Um, you know, we do have public access issues. We do have flooding issues. We have capacity issues. And um, we, we're located between these four different sites, which causes an awful lot of problems for us um, in terms of managing the collection and the care of the collection and staff inefficiencies and all the rest. So. So I'm very pleased to say that we're actually at a point in the gallery's history that the long-held ambitions of the library and archive might finally be realised. A plan is already in place for the next phase of development and is ready to go as soon as we have government approval, which I'm told, fingers crossed, is expected any day now. I was hoping I could actually announce it here today, but it wasn't to be. The snow, there was supposed to be something last week and then the snow happened. But this next phase of development in the gallery will focus on the facilities and services in the gallery. It will provide a new wing with, a, with the state-of-the-art research centre and storage facilities. So we're, we're going to be um, located centre stage uh, up within the gallery's main complex. Um, and it will be fully accessible and visible to all visitors. Um, a development which really, you know, we feel was symbolically and physically put learning and research at the heart of the institution. Um, and it will provide us with the urgently need space for growth and ensure that we can still uh, continue our role acquiring and preserving and making publicly accessible uh, research collections relating to the visual arts. So, um, Beckett, uh, I think, he could have been writing about the NGI library when he said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And I think you can see that every time with the gallery, it has got a bit better over the, the century and a half. But today, the National Gallery of Ireland, uh, thankfully, the Library and Archive has moved on from the past uh, cycle of unfulfilled potential. But given the past experiences and indeed the lessons learned along the way, we are cautiously moving forward um, to our new library, um, uh, a new National Art Library for Ireland, uh, uh, towards um, a new wing. And uh, the future looks challenging but bright. That's our new wing, if we ever get it. Thank you very much. Andrea, uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, if um, anybody has uh, any questions for Andrea. Thanks for that, that was great. Um, I'm Mark from South Dublin Libraries. It's a kind of a silly question. Did the librarian get his house? No, 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 it never came down here. It was just forgotten about because they, they were all spanking new up and up and then um, doubling it, you know. No. Thank you. Okay. 
Actually, I have a question. Um, what do you think swung it in the end? Was it the public engagement or just the fact that, you know, libraries and archives are sort of valued more now than they had been? I think for, for us to be in the, in the plans, you mean, for a new library, I think yeah. it's... Um, I think because it had been a, co a collection that um, th there were so many failed, uh, you know, opportunities down through the years, it kind of was always on the list, and thankfully it remained on the list. It's like the library's time will eventually come at some stage, but the fact that the, there, there has been such significant growth uh, in the department, as you say, and a renewed value for library and archive material, and we're really trying to and have, and have hopefully increased this public awareness about the collection and uh, like people really love it and um, I think that that has really helped but we have always been on the plans I have to say and if we're like I think the library is unfinished business for the the gallery like it's it's due its moment in the sun basically well, I hope you get it. yeah so do I <laughs> I'm Laura Shanahan, I'm the new Head of Research Collections at Trinity College Dublin Library. Um, I couldn't help but notice the ESB funding that you had for yes. one of the specific areas in the library. And I wondered if that's one of the things that you'd be looking to for this particular phase? Yes, of course. I mean, the funding, I didn't have time. There's so many things other, public engagement is huge for us, but there's been lots of things that have contributed to the growth and development of, um, of, the, of the department. But... Um, funding and private funding is, is huge for us and it's kind of we actually have a number of um, organizations that support the guys the esb is tied in with with the center for the study of irish art and we have them um, kind of 10 year actually actually we, we kind of like a partnership model so we try to get funding over a certain amount of years or the lifetime of a project rather than you know one year or whatever so we have a lovely wonderful partnership actually with the esb over 10 years, which is unheard of, actually. I don't know how we managed to do it, but uh, um, we're delighted. And uh, obviously, that, that kind of length of time as well helps you to really develop a good relationship, and you'd hope that it could be renewed again when the, the time comes. But, I mean, it's the world we're in now, with um, certainly in museums and galleries. Of course, we'll be looking for sponsorship to, to uh, advance that phase. There'll be a certain amount will be paid by uh, by the government, and then private, like all of the, the, the like the refurbishment, like um, the Millennium Wing, will have some kind of uh, funding as well, private funding element. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aoife, I'm in uh, St. Michael's College, but I was just wondering, when you said it's difficult for readers to get into the library, yeah. into the space, but they eventually make it down, what, in what <laughs> aspect do you mean that it's difficult? Um, well, it's in, the, the, and I'm talking about the main library reading room, it's located in what is essentially a staff-only area, and this is part of the problem, that people don't kind of chance upon us and find, we are a public library, we have a public collection that's publicly funded, we're all public servants, but people can't just sort of chance upon us and come into the library. Um, so you have to kind of, even though we don't like to say we're appointment only, you really do have to contact us in advance to, to come in. And then um, and then it's down through a tunnel. I'll, I'll show you afterwards if you like. It's like it's kind of through this mortifying tunnel. Um, if any of my staff are here, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's a quite embarrassing tunnel that nobody really outside of it, who doesn't work in the gallery should be exposed to at all. So we're looking at our access issues. Um, it's one of the, the, the things. I mean, that's, that's one of the main reasons we would be looking to get a new... Uh, library building but in the meantime I mean that obviously even if we got the go-ahead tomorrow you're still talking five or six seven years whatever so we still there's an access issue there that we are trying to address where you might come in through the back rather than having to go through this tunnel and there it's all stuff that's up for discussion at the moment but um, basically I suppose we miss out on the the visitor who just wants to come in and have a browse that uh, which is is uh, 
and they're out there. They are out there. You know, somebody comes in and sees a painting and they want to know more about the artist, whatever, they're, they naturally would go down to, to a kind of library area, whatever, but they, that isn't easy. People can do it, but it's not easy for them to do in here at the moment.